All right, so this video is serves as an introduction to the topic of global justice. Now, there are many questions that fall under the rather vague term global justice. Typically, global justice will include what states owe one another, as well as what individuals within different states owe one another. Sometimes it will cover the question of what states owe to non-citizens, that is to say individuals in other countries. As such, global justice addresses questions about what governments should do and how we should think about issues like immigration, refugees, citizenship, human rights, interstate relations, international trade, multinational corporations, producer cartels like OPEC, treaties about trade like NAFTA, global poverty, foreign aid, colonialism, secession, as well as what we should think of interstate organizations like NATO, the United Nations, and the European Union. Also, the cross-border activities of international non-governmental organizations like Amnesty International or the Red Cross. And finally, um, global justice also includes the slightly more precise question of global distributive justice, which asks roughly whether there are duties to redistribute wealth or income from richer countries to poorer countries or resource-rich countries to resource-poor countries. Typically, Global justice leaves questions of what counts as a just war or an unjust war to the subfield called just war theory, as well as what counts as just or unjust actions within war. Uh, but I think uh, that particular exclusion uh, is born out of history and custom uh, rather than um, any solid theoretical reason. I think it's just that just war theory is much older than a lot of these other issues. And so it grew kind of separately and has always been around. Let's get the lay of the land a little bit in terms of what kinds of views you might find uh, in the topic of global justice. Just like issues of domestic justice, global justice comes in many flavors and varieties, and the topic often grows as new interstate relation issues arise. For example, uh, in 1945, uh, the Holocaust and its aftermath and the Nuremberg trials uh, shook the norms of absolute state sovereignty, at least for European countries that had been developed by the Treaty of Westphalia. Countries decided at that point that there were some cases, like genocide, where interference in foreign affairs, of, I'm sorry, interference in the domestic affairs of another state were going to be justified. Now, typically, the field is divided into cosmopolitans, particularists or nationalists, and contractualists. Let's look at the, each of these in turn. Cosmopolitans hold that nationality is generally morally irrelevant as to how individuals ought to be treated, even if nationality, as they concede, has considerable practical weight in the world. In other words, for cosmopolitans, human beings have rights, no matter where they're from, and are morally equal no matter where they're from and these moral facts so to speak have implications as to what states should do cosmopolitans are usually quite critical of the current state system uh, the world is organized under and they usually endorse international institutions or the weakening of sovereignty or sometimes both moving on to particularists Particularists and nationalists don't necessarily deny that all people have rights, but they argue that there are special obligations individuals have with their co-citizens, uh, their fellow citizens, that usually defeat general obligations to foreigners. Uh, these nationalists and particularists are sometimes joined by communitarians who think that distinct forms of communal and cultural life are intrinsically valuable, and uh, these these communities are a basic precondition of moral evaluation in the first place and even a precondition of personhood as we understand it. Now, particularists aren't generally or don't have to be happy with the international state system as it is, but they usually recognize the moral importance of the claims states can make, uh, particularly in favor of non-interference in their domestic affairs. Nationality or community is going to be an important component of human well-being and as such it ought to re receive legal protection as well as respect. Moving on to contractualists. Now contractualists 
come in many flavors, but they often emphasize the importance of legal agreements between peoples, individuals, and organizations as a source of morality uh, between individuals across the world as well as states, uh, and organizations for that matter. Hobbes is often an inspiration to the extent that for Hobbes, contract actually created morality and justice where none existed beforehand. Uh, contractualists uh, see the world as uh, a potentially giant anarchy that is only mitigated by enforceable agreements between states, organizations, and individuals. Uh, contractualists are usually quite supportive of treaties and international organizations, without which they think the world would exist in a kind of Hobbesian anarchy. Of course, uh, without uh, a global enforcer to make sure that such treaties are in fact uh, abided by, uh, these contracts are often delicate and require more creative means to enforce them, although of course some contractualists will go so far as to suggest that some kind of world state or some kind of international interstate organization is necessary uh, to impose order upon individual states to make sure they live up to their agreements, in other words. Okay, so to wrap up briefly, no doubt a lot of what I've said is a bit too simplistic and it hides many variations and differences within these views and of course across views uh, there are some views that I haven't mentioned uh, just for the sake of simplicity. But uh, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day if you are the most liberal cosmopolitan or the most autarkic nationalist. The questions raised by an increasingly interconnected and globalized world are not going to go away uh, because you want them to, and they have to be answered. What should a state do if its neighbors abuse their citizens or attempt to develop nuclear weapons and thereby become a lot more threatening? Are we better off avoiding entangling treaties and international organizations or building and strengthening them so that they can respond to these challenges? In a digital age of global media, it's just not plausible to claim that you are going to be ignorant of the massive suffering that exists all over the world or the abyssal gap between the standard of living in rich countries and poor countries on earth. Which brings up the question, should anything be done about that? And what about issues like global warming, species extinction, loss of biodiversity, resource depletion, and global pandemics like Ebola or avian flu? How should the countries of the world respond to these kinds of challenges in a just way? This is why more and more people, including your professor, have this is this is what more and more people, including your professor, have been thinking about in recent years. I hope you'll be interested in thinking about this yourselves in the next few lectures.